using a linear model, but we also want to use as few variables as possible in order to generate our prediction. And the reason why we want to use as few variables as possible is because some of those variables might be expensive or you know, hard to actually have access to. And this is true of, um, this is true of many, um, many applications. Um, in, in real estate, if you're trying to predict the, the, the cost of housing, how much a house is likely to cost, which again is very, a very lucrative thing to do. If you can predict the price of houses, every house in Vancouver over the next two years, you'd be doing pretty well uh, financially. Um, there, there's many variables that you need to consider. Neighborhood, number of rooms, etc., etc. But you might also look at what is the GDP of uh, Canada, uh, how is the U.S. doing, um, importantly, well, how is the economy of China doing, and so on. And if you take all those variables, you're able to then make a prediction about the real estate, you know, look at population growth, and so on. However, some of those variables are very expensive to get. Um, and some you might just not have access to. And so you want to try to figure out exactly what are the important variables that are predictive of the price. Uh, what you're finding there is correlations. You're not finding causation. Okay, we've already argued this with the bears. Um, if you observe cancer and smoking, you have no idea of knowing what that cancer, you know that they're correlated, but you don't know if smoking causes cancer or if it is the case that people who have cancer like to smoke. Um, so that's um, the only way you can do that is through an experiment or through um, some more involved analysis, like using instrumental variables, which will be the topic of um, next Thursday, next week, Judy Pearl, the, the Turing Award winner this year, one of the top people in AI and machine learning, will actually be giving a talk um, on that topic. So Thursday, 3.30, I'm sure it's announced all over the department. Tomorrow, there is a talk right here at 3.30 on L1 and L2 regularization. Um, but that's the invited talk tomorrow. So I'm sure you, all of you would appreciate um, that talk. It will give you good revision if you still don't have this business clear. Okay, but what we're interested in doing here is identify variables that are variables X that are correlated with an outcome Y. And, and I argued, and I will come back to this picture. So if you don't get it now, um, I will come back to it, and I will give an introduction in the context of Ridge. Uh, for those of you that got it, um, I argued that if I plot the contours, the cost function has two components. It has a light blue component in my slides. And that's the, the, the likelihood that the sum of squared errors, that's the usual least squares criteria. And now to the cost function, I've added another term, which is the sum of absolute values of each theta. The reason why I do that is because I'm saying the cost will be high whenever the sum of squared errors is high or if the sum of thetas is also high. So in order to reduce the cost, I have to do two things. I have to make my theta small, and I have to make my error small. Not enough to make the error small. It's also important to make the theta small. I'm not only worried about making good predictions, I'm also worried about making the theta small so that I can identify which are the x's that are relevant. Because if one of the thetas goes to 0, I know I don't need that x. Right? Because if, say, theta 1 is going to 0, then I know I don't need x1, right? Because x1 times 0 will be 0. So there's no reason for me to even go and observe x1 or measure x1. Can we double the links? Uh, sure, thank you. I forgot about that. OK, that should be better. And so I will formulate this, this cost. Um, I argue that if I plot the contour plots of y minus x theta times 1 minus x theta, those are um, ellipses. And I know the minimum is at the center. 
And I also argue that if you look at the absolute value in 2D of two parameters, I basically have four lines. If I plot those four lines, essentially I have that, um, that square in the diamond in the middle. Those are the contour plots. Um, so in 2D, if you will, like I can't plot this in 2D, but what's really happening is I have my J of theta, which is my cost function. I have one component that is like this. And then if I cut it, there's ellipses. And then at the origin, there is this thing that I have no idea how to draw this. Um, but it will be, I guess, something like this. There, yeah, more or less. There's like a pyramid coming out of the origin. And then when those two curves intersect, that's where the solutions will be. Now, there isn't a single solution. There is a whole path of solutions, this red path here. And each point in that red curve corresponds to a different value of delta. Okay? I'm not going to spend more time in this picture, but I will come back to it after I do the ridge. Because in the ridge, it's easier for me to explain why this um, red path makes sense. And once I've explained the ridge, I will come back to this page and explain it in detail. Um, I will argue, and I'll, I hope you take my leap of faith on this, that if you have a pyramid and an ellipse where they intersect, and I will argue why it is intersections that we need to worry about and all other points later, but for now assume that the solutions are where these two uh, objects, these two surfaces intersect, then they will with great probability intersect at the corners. The corners coincide with the axis. And if they coincide with the axis means that uh, at the axis one of the variables is zero. So right now what it's intersecting is with the theta one axis and at the theta one axis the height of theta two is zero. So in this picture that I'm illustrating using to illustrate this here, the value of theta two for many values of delta will be equal to zero. And when delta is equal to zero, that theta two will be equal to the maximum likelihood of theta two. And when delta goes to infinity, when delta becomes very large, all the thetas will be zero. And that makes sense if you look at the cost function. Because in the cost function, if delta is like, uh, I don't know, a quadrillion, then the only way you can minimize j of theta is by making theta very tiny. Okay, so the second term dominates. And you have this trade-off. And a big question is how we choose delta. And I think Matt mentioned cross-validation. Today I'm going to go over that again. But let's, let's assume for now that we're happy that this is the objective function that we want to optimize. And let's make the leap of faith that this objective function will guarantee that when you do when you look at the derivative of this objective function equate to zero, many of the thetas will be equal to zero automatically. So the only thing that remains for us to do for learning is to derive the estimate of theta. Now how do we derive an estimate of theta if you have an objective function? Take the derivative and equate to zero. So there's our objective function. We need to take the derivative. Now, before we take the derivative, I'm going to rewrite this in a few different ways. So that's our objective function. But I can also rewrite this. And I'm going to assume that the matrix X is N by D. OK, so I have N observations with D attributes. Okay. So N students. And then for each student, I have measured the height and the weight. So d is equal to 2 in that case. And then um, I, I can rewrite this instead of vector notation. I can write this as the sum from i equal 1 to n over all the data points of yi minus xi transpose theta square. OK, because yi is just a scalar, so I can just square it. Plus delta squared 
sum over j equal 1 to d, the sum of the absolute values. Okay, so this is just, uh, again, y minus x theta transpose times y minus x theta. That's just our way in matrix notation of saying the sum of square differences between y and the prediction of y, which is xi theta. Okay, so this is our prediction for y. And the hat on top of the y is very important. It means that it's a completely different object. It's the prediction as opposed to the y. Okay, so we're still dealing with linear models where we have data. We have x's. What is that guy? We have, this is y is the height of the point. For a, and then this height here is y hat. So y hat is the value of y at the line with the model at x. And y is just the point, the actual date. So y hat is the prediction, which is in this case given by a line. And then y is the point in linear regression. I'm going to rewrite this also in the following form. I'm going to take the derivative. My intent is to find a derivative with respect to just one single theta. I'm going to call that theta, theta j. The reason why I don't do it with respect to all the thetas is because in this case that um, I can't actually, uh, that will not lead me to having an exact algorithm. I will not be able to, do, just like we did with rate and maximum likelihood, um, there we were able to compute the with respect to theta equate to zero and then I would be able to solve for theta. In this case it's impossible to do that and we'll soon see why the difficulty and it has to do with the absolute value. Since I'm going to take the derivative with respect to the j term, I'm going to rewrite this slightly in the following form as yi minus xij times theta j. Okay, so I'm going to extract the jth component and recall that these are vectors. Okay, this is the, the matrix x has vectors x1 transpose all the way up to xn transpose. Okay, so each x transpose is 1 by d and then theta is d by 1. There are d parameters, one for each input x, each dimension of x. And then I'm going to introduce this notation xi minus j. By that I mean all the x's but excluding the j <coughs> times theta minus j squared plus delta squared sum of a j equal 1 to d theta j. Okay, so let me just write that, make that more clear. So if I, if I have theta is equal to theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3, so the vector theta, then theta minus 2 is equal to theta 1 and theta 3. Okay. So theta minus j just means I removed theta j. And I removed it from... I removed it from this and I put it here. Okay, so I still have the same thing. Now, I'm going to do a bit of grouping of these terms. That's, uh okay, so let me do that with an example. I'm just concerned it's not theta 1, 0, theta 3. But it doesn't matter because it needs to be 
I can do an example. Let me, um, you have. So it's fine. Are you happy? Yeah. Let's do an example. Let's use that theta equal, theta is equal to theta 1, <laughs> theta 2, and theta 3. Okay. And let's say that theta j is equal to theta 2. So j is equal to 2. So D is equal to 3 in this case, because there are three features. Right? And I have Xi transpose uh, uh, theta. So I have Xi1, Xi transpose theta is equal to Xi1, Xi2, Xi3 times theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, which is equal to xi1 theta 1 plus xi2 theta 2 plus xi3 theta 3. And I can rewrite that as xi1 theta, sorry, xi2 theta 2 plus and now I'm going to group the other guys. Xi1 theta 1 plus Xi3 theta 3. Pardon? Theta 2. Theta 2. So I'm just regrouping it. So because I'm interested in J equal to. So I've taken it. Oh, <laughs> I see. Uh, no. <laughs> Got it. Um, and then this is just equal to xi2 theta 2 plus xi minus 2, which, which t I don't mean i minus 2, but I mean s getting rid of the second component times theta minus 2. Yeah. So basically, I'm just taking one, t I have an expansion in terms of d terms, and I'm going to take one term out, and the remaining expansion, that's what I'm calling xi minus j times theta minus j. Those, that one is separate because if you think about it, let's uh, let's put brackets here. The order there doesn't matter because there's no index i. There is no index i inside of that second sum. Yeah, but there's index j in the first sum. The j's are different j's. Oh, yes, the, the, they're different. Um, we can fix that easily. Call this J prime. <laughs> Pardon? OK, so let's go to the first line. J prime in the first line is just a dummy variable. It's an index from 1 to D. In the second line, that term is still separate. That term, that term is still, whoops. That term is still living. It's still on its own, separate from the first term. And it will continue being separate from the first term. It involves the variable J prime. It, it, it doesn't touch the first term at all, because I'm only playing with the first term. So what is the J in the first term? 
So the j in the first term is an index from 1 to d as well. Okay. And that index from 1 to d basically tells me which component of theta I'm choosing. So let's look at an example. Let's assume that theta has three components. In that case, d is equal to 3. So there are three inputs to the problem. In other words, y hat is equal to theta 1 x1 plus theta 2 x2 plus theta 3 x3. Okay, so it has uh, three components. And of course, there is a time index as well of a different subjects, and so we the x's and the y's have that index. Okay, so the data y i is assumed to come from a model which has parameters theta 1, which are the true parameters, x i 1 plus theta 2 x i 2 plus theta 3 x i 3 <coughs> plus noise. Okay, so that's the difference between y hat and y. y is the noisy version of y hat. If we have a line, that line has slope theta. For a particular value x, i, there is a height y i. And then the height of the line, that's y hat. Y, because y hat is just theta times x. Do you just randomly choose what j is? J equals to 2. Oh, I'm, this is an example. Um, so e.g. E e e j equal 2. If j is 2, it would be this. If I use j equal 3, then I would have grouped these two guys and then taken this out. So I have not. No, I'm just saying let j be any j. Okay. It is true for all j. Oh, okay, so then in this. Uh, so this slide, is true for all j. j. Is, has a domain of like one to one two. Oh, okay. I guess I was just confused because you just have a j there and I just didn't really know what number you're putting there. Yeah. Okay. So it's a variable that goes from 1 to d, and it just indicates which variable I'm choosing. So because I'm keeping it arbitrary, I don't want to say that it's 1 or 2 or 3 or d, I because I want to be able to compute the derivative with respect to theta when j is 1 and theta when j is 2. In other words, right. theta 1 and theta 2 all the way to theta d. Oh, so, okay. so like this where j is 1 of 1 to d is 1? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, is that clear now? How many people are happy to continue? Yeah, majority, good. Okay, so that's the, the sum of squares. And now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the derivative of j of theta. Now, when I take the derivative, and I'm going to erase this so that I can take the derivative. Okay, so let's take the derivative now. So I'm going to take the derivative of j of theta, and recall theta is a vector here, only with respect to the jth component. So I'm only going to find out what is the objective with respect to theta j, where j is 1 or 2 or 3. Okay. And I'm going to do it for each of the thetas. And the type of algorithm that I, we're going to do is um, an iterative algorithm of the following form. I'm going to come up with the best answer for theta 1. Once I know the best answer for theta 1, first I take a guess of all thetas. Just a random guess would do. Then I, then I pick theta 1 
and I will solve for the best theta one given all the other thetas and given the data, of course. Once I have found the best theta one, I set it to that value and I move <coughs> on to learn theta two and I find the best theta two for all the other thetas. Once I have found that theta two, I freeze it and now I update theta three. Once I found the best theta three, I freeze it and update theta four. Let's say that D is equal to four. In that case, after I finish updating theta four, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do theta one again. And then theta two, and then theta three, theta four. And I'm going to iterate many times like this. Did it converge? Always? In this case, it converges. I will not give you the proof of convergence. Uh, Oh, because you found the best theta one yeah. given the random choices of theta two, theta three, and theta four, uh, and theta four. But now, but if you had been given a different theta two, you would have come up with a different theta one. I see. Theta one is a function of the other yeah, thetas. It seems like Okay. It, it will be clear when I write down the algorithm, but, but we are going to update one theta at a time. And that particular theta I'm just going to call theta j. Why are we not updating all the and then updating them at once? Because there's a problem there. Absolute values. Have you ever computed the derivative of an absolute value? Okay. That's that's a technical. So we can do this for maximum likelihood for like linear regression when we don't have that term. Yeah, if we didn't have the absolute value, it wouldn't be a problem because we know how to compute derivatives. If we had there like a quadratic, like ridge, no problem. But the absolute value is what's giving us trouble. And we're going to come up with a different way of doing this. And we want to use derivatives. We will use a generalization of derivatives called uh, subderivatives, which I will define soon. can define convergence. How fast does it converge, though? Roughly speaking. There must be a result out there that says what the rate of convergence is for that algorithm. Um, I actually, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the reasonably quickly, though. It's fairly quickly, but. The, I, I can do better than just tell you that it's fairly quickly. Yeah, I, I, I can give you an actual convergence rate. Uh, not off the top of my head, sorry. Um, it would be one over the number of iterations, one over t or one over square root t. Um, it's, the function is convex, so you should be able to actually get a so we get very easy. fast convergence rate. I don't know what the best convergence rates are for this model. I, 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 Conjecture one of the two or something oh, well, like that. So all these subjective functions that we keep writing with some different free value that we keep adding to the end, they're just different ways of coming to the to a thing, right? That's correct. Exactly. So which is the best? <coughs> ah, good question. So we've seen we've seen maximum likelihood, which is the same as least squares, which means just use the first term, don't add anything. Then we saw ridge where you add something. And that, I argue, it's better because sometimes you might not be able to even invert the X transpose X matrix. And so Rich, um, provided that you have the right delta, can do better. Next week, you will get to code all these methods and you will have a first hands-on experience as how they compare against each other. This last soup also adds a term its advantage is it will make theta zero. The ridge will make the theta small, but the lasso will make them precisely zero. And when they're zero, it has the extra benefit that we can actually get rid of those variables because we know those variables are not useful. And coming up with good regularizers, that's the second term, is an art. And you know, there are people who devote their lives to this. I mean, in fact, everyone modeling cognitive processes and many models in science and social science and so on. It's coming up with good regularizers. It's part of modeling. Sorry, the regularizer is that delta term. Delta beyond that 
it's the, the whole term, delta squared times the sum of absolute values. Uh, the delta is the trade-off parameter. And delta we're going to choose. Delta is a scalar. If delta is very large, then the second term has more importance. If delta is very tiny, then the second term has less importance. In fact, when delta is equal to zero, the second term disappears. And so we're back to maximum likelihood. All right, so let's compute the derivative with respect to theta j. And now you'll see why I separated this. Because if I compute the derivative, it's the sum from i equal 1 to n of 2 times yi minus xij theta j minus <coughs> xi minus j transpose theta minus j times the derivative of, with respect to theta j of the guy inside, which is minus xij plus delta squared times the derivative with respect to theta j of theta 1 plus all the way up to theta d. Okay, I'm just rewriting it in that form. So I took the derivative of the first term. I did not take the derivative of the second term, but I just expanded it. And this is going to be equal to the sum over i equal 1 to n, 2. And now I'm going to group terms. Okay. I'm going to first, in fact, let me use different colors. I'm going to group this term here, um, this term with this term here. And so I can write that as xij squared times theta j. And I'm going to take the next term. And that's going to be whatever is left, which is, let's use different color. So, anyone colorblind? Mm. Email me if you are. <laughs> no, because I often use red. And so, yi minus xi minus j transpose theta minus j times xij. So in other words, this, this, and this. <coughs> Plus delta squared derivative with respect to theta j only of theta j. Right? Because I, I would have the absolute value of theta 1 and theta 2 and theta 3. But it is only the theta j, the derivative of any of the other thetas with respect to theta j will be zero. Right? So if I have the derivative with respect to theta 2 of theta 1 plus theta 2 plus theta 3, that's equal to the derivative with respect to theta 2 of theta 2 plus 0 plus 0. Okay, because the derivative, these guys don't depend on theta 1, so the derivative is 0. Okay, so we managed to get rid of a lot of the other thetas. I'm now going to introduce some names. I'm going to call this guy here. I'm going to give it the name of AJ. 
And then this whole guy here, I'm also going to give it a name. I'm going to call it CJ. And the only reason why I'm giving them names is so that I don't write them over and over again. Okay. If we do that, our equation of the derivative says it's aj times theta j minus cj plus the derivative of the absolute value. So, in other words, going ahead a bit, this is what I've been able to get. I have aj times theta j minus cj times the absolute value. So that will be easier to write than to write this whole monstrosity of sums, etc. Okay, so we have an expression for the derivative. We've done the derivative of the first term. There's a catch. We have to do the derivative of an absolute value. And that's problematic because the absolute value is not differentiable. Over here, the derivative is positive. This is the absolute value function. Y, it's basically you have y equal x on this side. And so the slope is plus 1. On the other side, the slope is minus 1. So we know what the slope is when x is less than minus 1. And we know what the slope is when x is greater than sorry, when x is less than 0, and we also know what the slope is when x is um, greater than 0. The problem is, what happens at x equals 0? We have a non-differentiable function. That function, there is um, an infinite number of possible slopes at the point, uh, at the corner. Okay, so if you have a corner, a perfect corner, you can't get a the pen to stay. If I had a parabola, I would be able to get the pen to stay. So, pardon? <coughs> okay, so you're getting ahead. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to introduce a new mathematical concept, one that none of you have likely seen before. It's called a subdifferential. And we will only need this concept it, it has many properties, but we don't need to concern ourselves with that. We just need that concept in order to be able to do the derivative of an absolute value. Okay. Why I introduced this concept is because this is a very important mathematical concept. Most of the current trend in how we are going to acquire data is based on the principle that we, instead of acquiring data in high resolution and compressing it, we are going to uh, get it straight from the world to a compressed version. And the data will always live in compressed form. And if we want to view the data, we can uncompress it and see it in its full splendor of high resolution. In order to get very high um, compression rates, people often use these L1 regularizers. There's a whole theory now called compressed sensing. And compressed sensing essentially is the label. Um, I don't know if we have engineers here. How many of you have heard of compressed sensing? Got one, two, three. Um, if you Google it, it's pretty hot in blogs and so on. Um, top mathematicians in the world, uh, the, 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 the few geniuses we have in the world, a few of them are all working in this area. It's a pretty hot area. And it's an area that is impacting our world and so I feel it's my duty to make sure you actually understand the concepts behind. So we're going to do, learn some differentials. It turns out that it's actually very easy. It's just like the concept of derivative. But in addition, at a, at a point where of non-differentiability, we're going to consider all the possible slopes. Starting from minus 1, you could think of this as all the possible has all the possible lines that you could entertain, all the possible lines that you could entertain 
putting it a corner at, at, at the corner of the house. So starting from here all the way to here. There's a whole set of lines. You could have this line or this line or this line or this line, this line, this line. Okay. So there isn't one derivative. There's a whole set of derivatives. That's the subdifferential. Okay? That's all there is to it. It's just we're just gonna say that there isn't one derivative, but there's a set. And the set could be anything that goes from minus one all the way from minus one all the way to plus one. And so that's what I'm saying that at x equals zero, the derivative is not just one, but it's a whole set. Any number between minus one and one. That's a subdifferential. That's all we need to know about it. We go back to our objective function and we're going to now differentiate it using the rule of the subdifferential. So let's look at the first case. Theta is negative. So we're in this case here when the, the slope is negative. When theta is less than zero, then the derivative of theta j with respect to theta j is just equal to minus one. And so all I'm going to do here is replace the derivative by a minus one. And I'm done with that case. Then I need to consider the case when it's greater than zero. This case here. So in this case, the derivative of theta j with respect to theta j is equal to plus 1. And so I have a plus 1 times delta squared. When theta is equal to 0, then I need to write here this, uh, something that goes from minus 1 to plus 1. It's a set. And the reason why I didn't write aj times theta j is because theta j is equal to zero. So aj times theta j is zero. And that's it. That's the derivative. How do we get now the theta hat? We equate to zero. Okay. How do we equate to zero? In the first example, I have aj times theta j minus cj minus delta squared is equal to zero. Oops, I meant to say a. And now I solve, so in other words, aj theta j is equal to cj plus delta squared. Okay. Um, one important fact I forgot to say about A is that AJ is guaranteed to be positive, right? Because it's the sum of squared terms. If you square anything, it's positive or zero. Oops. So, and then I can just solve for theta. So then theta, the estimate theta j then is just equal to cj plus delta squared over aj. And that is what I have here. So I just took the equa equation one in order to produce this equation. If I proceed exactly in the same way, let's pick this color. I can take this equation and that will give me this answer and then finally I take the one in the middle to give me the answer in the middle. Now the reason why I changed this is because when theta j is less than zero, if we look at it here, if theta j is less than zero and because a is positive and delta square is positive, because if you square any number, it's positive. So this term will be negative on the left. So for this to be negative, it must be that uh, cj has to be less than minus delta square. In other words, c has to be greater than delta square. And so that's why I change uh, this one here. So if cj is less than minus delta squared, um, 
like if delta squared is 10 and if c is minus 100 then it will be negative for example and that's how I come up with my theta j that's the estimate that's the last the, the, the sparse estimate of theta and as you can see there is one situation in which the theta will be precisely zero whenever that term c which is the difference between y and the prediction for all the other variables except the j's variable whenever times the input whenever that term c is between <coughs> minus delta and delta that particular theta will be zero but now this is the answer for theta j for just one theta but then I need to compute this answer for all thetas for all j and that's what the algorithm will do the algorithm actually turns out to be easy to implement you can implement this in 10 minutes in Python or MATLAB um, you initialize theta first so that's what we would do first we initialize and you may want to initialize just using ridge but if you just pick a random theta that's also good just pick any random theta if you wanted to converge faster you might start from a good solution like the ridge or the maximum likelihood and then you keep repeating until converge and we know that we've converged when the theta stop us changing when they, they're always after many iterations they stop changing we know that um, they've converged and so we do this for all d we repeat this for all d we first compute aj using the formula of aj we compute cj using the formula for cj and then we just do the check if cj is less than minus delta squared use the first formula if it's greater than delta squared use the last formula and if it's none of those cases then theta zero which is what we had from our derivation um, go ahead I have no constraint to make sure that theta j is positive it may or may not be positive if cj is suppose delta squared is 100 if cj which is this difference between the predictions due to the other terms if cj is less than that 100 then I set theta uh, to be equal to cj plus delta squared divided by j in fact let's assume that delta squared is um, 10 and let's assume that c is minus 100 okay so minus 100 in that case is less than minus 10 and so theta in that case will be negative because it will be minus 100 plus 10 divided by something that's positive so minus 90 divided by a so thetas can be positive or negative and many times they will be zero and that's why we'll um, we'll get it to work that's it that's the algorithm it requires the introduction of this the sub differential thing but beyond that it's just equating a derivative you just need to keep track of the three cases the positive side, the negative side, and where you don't have a slope. So when we are calculating theta j, we are using the updated values of a j and c j for all the thetas which has already been updated. Like That's correct. So as you can see here, we're looping from j equal one to d, and each theta is using the previous values. So why do we use one value of aj and cj and update all of them at once? Oh, because cj is a function of theta, of all the thetas. So I can't pre-compute it. Oh, but you, you, however, have hit on something very smart, which is aj does not depend on theta. So I can pre-compute aj. I can take aj outside. So if you're a good programmer, you would first compute aj before you go into the repeat loop. But you can't escape, you can't escape the, and then you'd be able to pre-compute x times y, but you would not be able to escape computing c at every duration, because c keeps changing. 
but when we use the gradient search method for linear regression, don't we do the same thing? Calculate the partial derivatives up to the and then do it stepwise? Yes, we're, we're going to look at it soon. But here, what, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing, I'm actually following gradients, um, even though I haven't put it that way. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to first update theta 1, given the other thetas, and then I update theta 2, given the other thetas. So I'm going one at a time. So a good way to think about it is you're on top of graphs, and you can either go east-west, or north-south. And so what you do is you start going down until you, until you actually get to a place where that doesn't go down anymore. In that case, you turn and you look for where it goes down and you keep going down. And when you can't go down anymore, you go back to north-south and you check and you keep going down. That's essentially what the algorithm is doing going this way, then this way, this way, this way. It's cutting. And in this case, as I haven't proved it to you, but this is actually convex, so it's actually, this algorithm actually converges. It doesn't always converge if, if we change the objective function. So I'm trying to understand the reasons for eliminating some theta. So I mean, one of them is uh, that some theta, some parameter would be expensive to measure. Mm -hmm. Or is it? In addition, is it also the case that some of the parameters can just add noise to the estimate or prediction? And so then we just want to get rid of them? Yeah, you might also want to get rid of parameters that are actually just describing noise. When I talk about nonlinear regression in like two hours, I will discuss that. All this thing you're constantly depending on this big delta square. How to get delta square is coming up soon. Converge means that converge means that there, you reach a point where whether you're looking this way or this way or this way or that way, you can't go downhill. And so, as time goes by, you're always stuck at the same place because you can't go. That, so theta stopped changing. So in this algorithm, you could you go through it again and with a certain set of thetas, and the thetas wouldn't change. When the d all thetas all don't change after one iteration, when means you're stuck, and you stop. If theta is no longer changing, that means there's no point in keep running the algorithm. You've reached the point where you can't go down anymore. Is it the true global minimum? In this case, it is. I haven't proved that yet. Oh, it's, co it's called coordinate descent because I'm sort of going north-south coordinate and then I'm going east-west coordinate. And I'm always trying to find the best theta along those coordinates. If you're looking for homework for it's there. <laughs> so this algorithm finds the global maximum of, maximum of the objective function J. Um, the value of the is the global maximum of the, of the objective yeah. function. We will, J. when we do optimization later in the course, I'm going to have to do optimization to teach you how to do neural networks. And then I will give it as an exercise for you to prove that this is convex. And hence, you're guaranteed to how does that value theta differ from theta ridge? Pardon? The, the theta ridge we start with, the initial guess. Mm -hmm. how, how, that's not the global maximum then? No. Theta ridge is the solution to a different problem. Okay. Here I'm, I'm starting with theta ridge because I'm assuming that theta ridge might be good. But sometimes you might want to start with theta equal random. And when you implement this, actually try different initializations. Just pick theta equal a random bunch of random numbers. It will work. Mm -hmm. Of course, if, if the minimum is here and you start by that door, you'll get quicker to it than if you start in Burnaby. Mm -hmm. 
because the algorithm is going to come to go down all the way to here. And the whole point of this is so that we can eliminate something like D. Yeah. In the original. And, and, and at the end of the day, you get theaters. And if you want to do predictions, it's the same game as before. If, if you have a new x, then for that new x, you just multiply that times theta, and that gives you your prediction. So we also have a way of making predictions. It's still a linear model. But the added benefit now is that many of the thetas will be zero. And so we, we've been able to identify relevant variables. So an example where this is applied a lot is in genetic. If you want to try to forecast how well a patient will survive, and you're just looking at 20 genes. In that case, these genes, you know, you're measuring 20 genes, and you want to identify which of these genes is actually responsible for recovery. So you want all the thetas to go to zero, and then you might have three thetas that survive. And then you know those three thetas. They're the three thetas that are correlated with prostate cancer. So those three, you've identified the three genes correlated with prostate cancer. You still don't know which ones cause it. For that, you need to then go into experiments. But instead of tampering with 20,000 genes, you now only need to tamper with three. So you'll be able to design drugs much quicker. That's correct. This picks the variables that matter. And it's useful for reducing cost. It's also useful because it's, it's discovery. You actually identify which are the relevant variables. Sorry, guys. I so basically this algorithm runs until the hardware says CJ equals that for the right no longer changes. So until that the stuff on the right of the CJ equals the twos. Wait, in which line are you in? Um, CJ equals the So we're running until theta converges to Yeah, that's correct. So so at each iteration, you're gonna repeat this many times as many times as until theta stops changing. And every time, you have to visit each of the thetas. So you visit the first one, you compute a CJ, and then you compute, and then you do, you check that if statement, and then you do the appropriate update, and then you move on to the next one. Move on to the next theta. The next theta, that's correct. So uh, all the algorithms we have seen, like least square regression and theta rich, rich expression. So all of them give the global optimum for the respective. Yeah. So for rich and maximum likelihood, it's obvious because when we differentiate an equate to zero, we get it. And 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 the reason why it's global, it should be obvious why it's global because this is the objective function. There's only one minimum. With neural networks. With neural networks, we're going to have this situation. So it's going to get hairy. But it's OK. We'll be able to deal with it. But we can use the same method for calculating the. That's correct. And this technique, adding an L1 regularizer, is also important in neural networks. And you've just primed it for the next part. On the right hand side, if you took a collection of images, okay, and each image you you code it as a vector, just like you did in your homework. So just the same matrix, same thing as you did in your homework. When you, if you took a collection of images and computed the SVD, each each vector of v, you know, you get u times sigma times v transpose. Each vector v transpose is in itself an image, because it's a vector and you can unwrap it back to being an image. Each of those v vectors is one of these little images in the big image. The one that's just like two waves, that's v1 transpose. The second one is v2 transpose v3. So recall that the clown, if I took the first eigenvector expansion, it was sort of the broad brush strokes. And then the smaller eigenvalues then would give the 
the, the sort of tiny brush strokes, sort of big oscillations. So wave and then more wavy and so on. That's what PCA gives us. PCA gives us these filters. PCA, I also mentioned in a section that I put in as advanced, and this again is advanced, so I'm not going to examine you on this, but I think this is for those of you interested in cognitive science and what's going on in the world of neural networks, um, this is useful to know. Um, with PCA, I'm only minimizing, PCA, I argued, was the solution to this, where B will turn out we can prove, I haven't done it in this class, I'll do it in 540, that we can prove that B is equal to U sigma and that C is equal to V transpose. That's if I didn't have that plus lambda, the L1 norm of C. If I didn't have that penalty, if I didn't have this, and I, I decide to optimize and ask for the components to be orthogonal, I get PCA. PCA is the optimal solution to that optimization problem. That's one theorem that we prove in 540. We also, in 540, give us an exercise to generate this plot, which are the basis V transpose. So this is V1 transpose, V2 transpose, and so on. However, if I add a regularizer, this is what I get. If I add that L1 norm, I get sparse spaces. And I get them to be local. And what, what, this, image is, what this image here, let's look, for example, at this image. This is just one of the receptors. What this is saying is that there is a region that is black on one side that is dark on one side and that is light on the other side. What's dark on one side and light on the other side? An edge. Okay, it's dark here, light here. It's always dark on one side and light on the other side. So you can think of each of these Vs as being a detector for the line in the world. So in fact, in neural networks, each of these guys is essentially the receptor field of a neuron. Uh, sort of matches the measurements that we've made in the visual cortex in V1, where each neuron is basically one of these guys. So you can think of C as the level of activation of the neuron and the principal components as all the synaptic nerves coinciding to that neuron. C is where it fires a knot and then the amount of intensity of the synapse. I'm going to get more into the neural networks later. But the key to be able to get these results was to add that L1 norm. So the L1 norm is not just for linear regression, but we, we use it a lot in all sorts of problems. And tomorrow in the talk, in the distinguished lecture series here, um, you'll, there'll be lots of examples on L1 and L2 norm. That's basically this lecture. So I'm going to start revision soon. So whoever needs a break, I think we all could take a break now. How about we do take a 10 minute break and be back here in 10 minutes.
course, if you're going too slow, it's going to call it. Yeah, you're going to get there. You still have to fill so it. So that's the. I believe that's the rate is one over two. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 